hello and welcome to everybody for joining tonight. Um, my name is Anna and I'm one of the event directors at the Great Aussie Hike. Um, tonight is a session that we're dedicating to how to prepare for the Great Aussie Hike um, and our upcoming morning to trek around the Mornington Peninsula. So it's going to be a little bit different from some of the other sessions you've done with us where we've more focused on putting up a PowerPoint presentation and lecturing to you. Tonight we've assembled a panel of really amazing people. We've also decided not to do it in the webinar format where all you can see is our faces. We really, we're really big into community and people here at the Great Aussie Hike. Um, so we've left it as a meeting so you guys can all participate at the end and ask your questions and we can interact and see each other. Um, it's also great to see some familiar faces that you might then see out on course um, in a couple of weeks. Um, but we just asked that while we're doing the, the start of it, if everyone can just stay on mute, that just makes it a lot easier for everyone to hear what's going on. Um, so anybody who's come here tonight looking for the information on the course, share the distance, all those kind of things, we've already run the information session on that. So that's best to go back and download your participant guide that you'll find that's been in your training dashboard now for a couple of weeks. That's got all the links to the sessions that we ran through all that. We don't want to take up, that's a good hour to go through all that and we don't want to take up everyone's time who's already done that. Tonight we're really focusing on your training, your nutrition, hydration, injury prevention and a couple of those types of things. So let's start off by introducing um, our panel of wonderful people who have given up their time to come and help you all tonight. Um, so we've got my co-director, Luke, um, who's here. Give us a wave, Luke. Um, so Luke is going to talk to you all about training. He's designed the course and written the, the training program. So he's the best person to hear from about making sure that you're ready to hit the course. Um, we've also got if Fiona, if you're here, yell out. A Fiona is actually running a retreat at the moment. She's going, oh, Fi was that a Fiona? Yes. No, okay, we'll take you from it. Okay, we also have um, Emma, who's a senior podiatrist at the Foot Centre Group. Um, she volunteered and helped out um, some of our walkers from last year. We'll love Emma from helping helping out last mm -hmm. year. She's also volunteered um, on Oxfam before. So she's very experienced um, at getting you along the course. Um, she has written here in her bio that she's hopefully going to be a great Aussie hiker in 2024. Don't know if we can <laughs> allow that. We need you. <laughs> we need everybody else on course. <laughs> um, we also have Dr. Verity Boyd from Bayside Osteopathic Clinic. So Dr. Boyd and her colleagues are going to be helping out at two of our wellness stops um, along the course. So Verity is also currently studying an advanced um, titled Osteopath in Sports. Is that right, Verity? Um, and her passion is helping you reach your sporting goals. So it is great to have her um, and her colleagues on board this year to help us out. Um, most of you will know First Aid Tony. He has been with every step of the Great Aussie Hike since our very first time in, in Gippsland. Um, Tony is not just a first aider, he's also a wilderness medic. So we are so lucky to have his expert advice out there helping you guys along. He himself is also a passionate hiker. Um, he's actually putting his trip to Nepal um, on postponement um, until he gets through the Great Aussie Hike and gets you guys all to the finish line. Um, and then he'll be heading off over to Nepal. So not only is he helpful with first aid, he's a great source of um, ideas and help and, and knowledge for all things about getting to the finish line. Um, and his main thing is he just likes to help you guys stay as fun and have as much fun out there as possible. Um, we've also got Stefan and Jess who are lovely um, and having a bit of a chat to everybody at the start. So these guys are our past walkers and some of our um, Great Aussie Hike ambassadors. Um, most of you will know Stefan, he pops up quite a bit. He makes some um, great content for his YouTube channel, Healing Hikes Australia, um, which is great to top on and see past, past events. Um, and also he does a lot of info videos. Um, and Jess is um, passionate about the um, outdoors, but she is also a volunteer leader for the Body Positive Women's and Non-Binary Folk Adventure Group called Escaping Your Comfort Zone. So welcome and thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. But tonight we're, oh, just some questions. We will run through um, the questions that we've got for the panel first. Um, if anybody has any questions, pop them in the chat, um, but we are gonna have lots of time for you to chat to them. So um, it, it's even great, we love, if you can hold your questions and actually ask them in person. Um, it's always much, much nicer than reading them off the screen. Okay, so Luke, let's start with you. Um, you have designed the course, you've put together the training resources. Do they match up together? Is this a training program specific for this course or is it just a general walking program that you've designed? Um, yes, this has actually been developed with this course in mind, and um, but it does work as a general training as well. Uh, there's definitely, um, it also looks at the limited time that people have during the weeks because we know we all get busy as well. So it is for this course, but it's also can be used as a very general one as well. 
So day one explores the southern part of the Mornington Peninsula, which we all know is gorgeous. I'm sure everybody's very excited to get out there. We can actually see from one of the photos behind you, I'm wondering if you've done that on purpose, um, is put the, the climb up to Blue Range Wellness Stop there. It's so it's, it's got rolling hills. How do people prepare for this who are out on course day one? Oh, definitely just get your legs into the training. Um, get some strength into them as well. So we get out there walking, doing the physical strength as well. Um, and get that fitness built up. Um, it is enjoyable. It's, out, it's beautiful out there. The, the more relaxed and enjoy it, uh, you can see more out there and just enjoy it that. So getting that fitness out and underneath, fitness so, and strength with you. Yeah, so is it enough for people just to just to go walking or do they need to do a little bit more to be able to take on some hills? Oh, I'll definitely get some strength in there as well. So there's the, the strengthening exercises um, in the training programs and these are just very simple ones, body weight mainly, and they can they, they help out with your, your fitness levels for while you're walking. How hard are the hills? Like that picture behind you, I'm going, oh, wow, that's a big hill for me to get up. How hard have you made it for everyone? I've not tried to make it hard. I've made it, tried to make it as, easy, as accessible for everyone as they go. So, yeah. look, and that's there is some challenges in there, um, but it's just about getting your one foot in front of the other and keep on going. You've got your teammates to support you through all that and get that training in behind you and it just makes it a whole lot easier. And where have you put these hills? Are they at the end of the day? Uh, they're conveniently placed nicely in the middle of the day. So a bit of a warm up through the first sections and then into the middle of the day where um, up over the hill. So section three of day one would be the most difficult. Um, but it also finishes with the greatest bit of up the Arthur Seat Eagle. So do I need to be able to climb up Arthur's Seat? You don't actually climb the entirety of Arthur's seat, but you do come up the side of it and traverse around the edge. So there is a bit of a climb there beforehand. So that one little climb up Arthur's seat, is it's over about a kilometre, isn't it? That's the tough part of day one, isn't it? Correct. It's yep. it's about a 10K section and there's that the, the tough climb is in the middle of that. And as long as I do all those strengthening exercises you've put in that program, I'm going to be able to get up that. Do those strengthening exercises, get some train that training under your belt, and it'll definitely help you get up there. So day two course is a lot flatter. Our 57 kilometer and 30 kilometer teams that are joining us, do they then not need to worry about strengthening exercises? They don't have any hills to climb up. Definitely not. It, the strengthening exercises and the stretching will just help your muscles for the whole time. So it helps your fitness the whole along all the way along the journey. And the better you feel out there, the more you enjoy it, the more scenery you see and the greater experience it is for you and everyone else around you. So it's important not to just go out and walk and go, I'm doing a big walk, I can just walk. They need to be doing a few little extra things you've popped in there. Correct. Get those extra days of strength and stretching in. Um, makes your body feel better and you can actually and helps your recovery. Um, so you can actually get that, that more, more time out there on your legs. So something I hear a lot is obviously we've got some really big distances um, with this event. 100Ks is no small feat. So then I hear people going, oh, I'm only doing the 30Ks. I don't have to train much. What do you say to that if you hear that? Look, it's not just a 30Ks, okay? 30Ks actually is difficult. It is has its difficulties and it, it's actually very equivalent to the 43 and the 57. Um, you're out there the entire time. You're walking the entire distance. You don't have a support crew with you. So there's the, not that option to share the distance and have that rest. Um, so it is a challenge in itself, but getting a few Ks under your belt, get some strength and into you definitely helps out. Now you were talking about swimming before is great for the fitness, but once you've done with that, grab on, get on the legs and get those walk, that walking um, fitness into yourself as well. So everybody's life's very busy. There's lots going on. What about people who, for whatever reason, haven't been able to do the training cycle since they signed up that's been in the dashboard um, and they, they might not have even started on the eight-week training program yet? There's five weeks to go. Can they still participate? Definitely. Jump on, have a look, uh, jump in your training dashboard, check out the training resources and you'll find the eight-week program in there. Jump into that. It's actually set up as a very, very simple at the start. So you can jump into week three. See how you feel about that. You may feel more comfortable trying week two and then stepping up to week four. But 
you can definitely jump in at any stage of that and get those that get those k's under your belt so best thing i can do go and download the eight week the eight week training program from the training dashboard and yep. just jump in get started and just pick it up and and make sure that i turn up at the start line that's it so will you get yourself to the start line we'll get you to the end that's the way to do it you're going to give us all a piggyback oh if i have to but uh I think the, the big buggies might help out if need be. In the participant guide, um, I saw you talking something about tapering. What's that? So tapering basically is allowing your body to recover from your training and get itself to its peak physical um, stage. So the most important weeks of the training program are week six and seven, where they're doing your longest distances. Um, you see week eight and the that's where it tapers. So you're doing shorter distances. You're still walking, but it allows your body to recover and the muscles all to recover to a good stage. Um, so you're in peak performance ready for the challenge days. Um, if you look through, you'll see that you actually don't cover the distances that we do on the challenge um, in any of the training. But as Jess was saying, she'd only walked 12 Ks and then she's walked 30 Ks on the day. Um, Part of that is that rest in between. So keep your body moving. So go out for those little shorter walks, but you're not stressing your body in those two weeks. Part of that is also the community of the Great Aussie Hike and Please. the atmosphere that is created in the event and, and being with your team members as well and you know supporting each other and just encouraging each other as you walk past other walkers and the buggy that comes along, you know, with its lights and streamers and you know the party in the buggy and so all of those things kind of energize you along the way as well completely jess yeah completely agree and that as you said the community is a massive influence on that so luke what i'm hearing is i was a big crammer for exams when i was at uni um left it all to the last minute and could, could cram it in you're i'm hearing from you don't go and go for a big walk the day before the event don't try and cram all the training into the last week <laughs> Unfortunately, physically, that doesn't work for this sort of training for an event like this. Um, not like exams where you, uh, where it works for the mind, but then you forget it three days later. Um, but for this sort of event, yeah, it does work very well. Thanks heaps for that, Luke. All right, Tony, so you've done a few great Aussie hikes with us. What would you say the biggest things that you think people need to prepare for an endurance event from what you've seen? Look, I think, Anna, you said the, the word preparation, and, and I think that's key to this, and Luke hinted at that with, with the training program. Um, we all know prior preparation prevents you-know-what, um, and, and it, it's very, very apparent with, with what we're doing with up to 100 k's walking. Um, nutrition and hydration are the two things that are going to get you through the weekend or the, the two days, along with a fabulous mental attitude. Uh, and we're going to talk about that a bit later, I know. Um, but as far as, as what we've got here, it's nutrition, it's hydration, it's getting yourself through the two days with your teammates and your colleagues and the staff and everyone else out there that's going to make this two days absolutely fabulous for every one of us. And it doesn't matter whether we're working on it or whether we're walking on it. Um, it's about just having fun and, and doing what we do and what we love. Um, no surprises. That's what it's all about. So go out and test your shoes. Mm test your socks, test your nutrition, test your hydration um, so that on the day there are no surprises. Um, we're more than happy with our team to come and help you if you need it, but a good day is when we're really bored um, and we have nothing to do. Uh, and if we've got nothing to do, that means everyone's out there and they're really, really well prepared. Um, listen to your body. That's probably the best thing. Listen to what it is telling you. If you've got aches and pains, listen to what that ache and pain might be. Um, if you've got hot spots with your blisters, stop, relax, fix them, and then move on. Don't push through. Otherwise, you're going to come and see me at the first or second wellness stop, and you're going to be in a world of hurt. So um, stop in the middle of the track, get your teammates, get your little first aid kit out, and get those hot spots um, attend to them, and then you won't have to see me um, or one of our team at the uh, at the wellness stops. Um, so check your energy levels, um, and that's the nutrition and hydration, which we'll go into again shortly. Um, and uh, go and have fun. We like having fun. 
But obviously, if people, as you said, prepared, they're going to have a lot more fun um, on the day. And I think a really important point there that you've raised, Tony, is these training sessions are not just about training and getting the Ks into your legs. It is also about training in your shoes, wearing the same hat, putting on, trying a new sunscreen, testing out your snacks and your drinks and stuff like that. And as you said, no surprises. Use your training sessions to do everything as you would on challenge day, even what you're going to eat the breakfast before you go out on course. Um, but you've mentioned their nutrition and that's really important. Um, I think a lot of us understand the basics behind nutrition, but sometimes it can be hard to come up with ideas. So I'm going to throw it open to the panel now and see if um, some of our walkers will give us some suggestions on their favorite snacks and food that they have for long walks. So Stefan, um, are you with us? Do you want to throw open and tell us what you eat um, and help give everybody some ideas for food? Hi Anna, and thanks heaps for having okay. me on the um, on the panel. And um, yeah, congratulations everyone for signing up. So my personal options are I like a nice lean meat, um, like a chicken or a um, turkey or a ham, and I make a nice salad wrap um, with that. Um, and I have that sort of at the 25, 50 and 75 kilometer mark. Um, obviously everyone has dietary requirements, allergies and different needs. So please have a look at the nutrition label on anything that you are consuming um, to make sure that you're getting the right proteins, carbs and fats in your diet. Um, so yeah, I like to have some nice ham salad rolls or wraps. And then um, in regards to snacks, I might let someone take over from that one and they can say what they like to have as snacks. All right, Jess, how about we bring yeah, you in? So um, I love a banana. So I've always got a banana in my pack um, and some scroggin um, for when I do. Can you tell us what scroggin is, Jess? Because not everyone yeah, knows scroggin. So um, scroggin is generally a mixture of some sort of chocolate, fruit, nuts mix. Um, so my personal favourite is things like apricot delights, licorice bullets, um, macadamias, peanuts, um, chia seeds, um, banana chips, sultanas, any kind of fruit and nut mix really, um, and a little bit of chocolate in there as well to keep it going. I might, I might jump in, Anna, if I could. Yeah, go for um, it, Tony. Uh, a couple of things. Complex carbohydrates are fabulous. Um, simple What's a sugars. complex carbohydrate, Tony? Complex carbohydrates, anything. Give us some examples. That, yeah, uh, gee whiz, um, nuts, fruit, yep. anything that's not a simple sugar at the end yep. of the day. So a simple sugar such as lollies and even chocolate to a certain extent, you're going to get a really quick high, but you're going to get just as quick a low when you come down off that simple sugar because your body processes it really, really quickly. And then all of a sudden, um, you've got nothing left in the tank. So complex carbs and some proteins and a very small amount of fats um, are what your body's going to crave on something like this, utilize your support team, folks. Yeah. Get them to carry all the heavy stuff that you're going to eat at the wellness stops and then only carry, um, as we heard, trail mix or scroggin, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, I, again, I put cashews, macadamias, uh, banana chips, um, maybe the occasional licorice bullet as well, Jess, because they're just amazing, especially the raspberry ones. Um, they're the bomber. Um, and stay away from the lollies and the stuff that you're going to process really, really quickly. Um, and uh, as far so as... Tony, we've just had asked, what's, what's the reason for very little fat? Just um, your body can't process it well. Um, and when you're doing such an amount of exercise as you're going to be doing specifically with the 100-kilometre walk, your body can't process it. Um, and if you are constantly exercising, you may in fact end up with things like diarrhea if you have too much fat in what you're eating. And that's not pleasant when you're out on course. Tony, we see a lot of people um, get salt cravings. How is it if they are rigging their support crew and saying, go and get me salt and vinegar chips? That yeah, look, um, it's more an electrolyte imbalance in your body. Um, yep. It's not specifically salt. Um, obviously, at the wellness stops, we will have electrolytes there for the taking. but um, my go-to on any hike, and I'm training, as you said, Anna, to go to Nepal at the moment, um, a couple of days after the Great Aussie hike, um, I'll take a bottle of water and a bottle of pre-mixed electrolyte, um, and that's where you will mix the two, have some out of the water, some out of the electrolyte, and you go backwards and forwards. Yeah. You won't overdo the electrolytes. You won't suffer from hyponitremia, which is too much water in your system and dilution yeah. of those salts. Yeah. Um, so you need the electrolytes, um, and you won't get those salt cravings. So yeah. electrolytes are good. I think that's a really um, important part is not to forget the water. We um, 
saw that a little bit in Beechworth. People were just on electrolytes and they got mm. three quarters down the course and they were just really needing water. So yeah. it's important to carry both. Um, we are very lucky that we have Aqualite as a partner. Um, we recommend actually getting some Aqualite and making sure you're used to it in your system. So if you are taking it at the wellness stops, it's not something, again, you, no, no surprises, nothing new to your system. Um, and if you look in your training dashboard, they've given us a great 20% off um, discount promo code. It's And it's good to be using while you're out training. But yeah. Tony, hopefully it's not a really hot day. If it's not, how important, like say it's a day like we've had today, about 20, 21 degrees, how, how important is hydration still? Um, without hydration, your body's going to give up on you. Um, it's more important than nutrition, in fact. Um, you can survive uh, many, many days without, uh, without food, but only a couple of days without water um, so, or, or fluids in your system. Um, and when we do uh, triathlons at Medical Edge, one of the things that we often have to do is cannulate people and put fluids into them um, intravenously because they've just got nothing left. Now, obviously, we don't want to have to do that at the Great Aussie Height because you're all going to hydrate really, really well. Um, between 400 and 800 mils per hour is what you should be all looking to consume, which is a combo of half water, half electrolytes. Um, if you're at the smaller end of the body scale and it's not quite so warm, then 400 to 500 mils is fine. If we get up to 28 or even 30 degrees and you might be like Luke and six foot two, then 800 mils is about what you want to be looking at per hour of walking or exercise. Um, it might seem a lot, but it's in fact not a great deal um, when, you're, when you're out there, especially on day one where it's a little bit tougher um, and a little bit hillier. Um, so 400 to 800 mils is what we should uh, we'd be recommending for everyone to look at based on physical stature and how warm it's going to be. I would definitely recommend if you don't have one, a hydration bladder. Um, they're so great to use on track because you've got your straw there. You can just have a sip along as you're walking. You don't necessarily have to stop to get your drink bottle out of your pack. Um, that's a great thing. I always have water in my um, bladder and then electrolyte um, mixed fluid in my drink bottle. So I always carry the both. Um, so yep. Justine has just asked for a recommendation on electrolytes. I was actually just trying to find some Aqualite that Luke's cleaned up the office, so I don't know where anything is. Hang on um, a sec. But <laughs> have you got the little satchels? Um, these are the great, these are what um, Luke and I use whenever we go out, um, Justine. So you can just put them in your drink bottle. Um, they're a little tiny satchel that just drops in, um, mixes up. It just tastes a bit like cordial. Um, I find I can't drink too much. It gets a bit sweet. That's, um, a, so that's, that's a big that's pack. That's the big one. 20 litters. <laughs> Yep. Um, that's, that's but you can we, just get an individual pack yeah. that'll do a 600 ml bottle to a litre. Or, Tony, do you get that and just put that in your drink bottle? Uh, I, I get it like this and then I measure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but if you don't want to, yeah, just to be able to chuck in your backpack, we always have, um, you just get them in a little box. I can't even remember how many is in a box. Um, and they're just enough for one drink bottle. They're, they're brilliant. Um, so, Tony, let's have a talk about... Um, how many people when you're treating injuries actually at the Great Aussie Hike, do you find that they had the injury while they were training, they ignored it and brought it into the event? Um, quite a lot because at the end of the day, the training is also quite intense. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm sure our podiatrists, et cetera, can, can attest to this, that when you're pushing your body through your training and you're building up your muscle base and you're building up your endurance base, there may be some niggles that develop. I've got a sore groin at the moment because I walked 25 k's the day before yesterday at Arthur's Seat where we've got our, our trail. Um, and uh, it's just a little bit tender. So I've put some ice on that and I'm going to give it two days off and then I'll get back into it. So again, those words, listen to your body. Um, and if you do have some niggles during this last few weeks of your training, get them looked at, do some research. Um, ice is your friend for any sort of inflammatory things that are going on. Um, we use the RISA principle in paramedicine, which is rest, ice, compression, elevation, and then referral if needed. Um, so uh, because it's repetitive type injuries, um, ice is your friend. We will have ice packs on course, obviously, but we hope that people won't have those um, stress-based injuries. So just again, listen to your body, folks, see what it's telling you, and then um, try and not bring those injuries with you on course on the day. Get them looked at prior. 
Um, if you need to go and see your GP, pretty tough at the moment, but you can get nurse on call. You can get virtual ED and virtual doctors. Well, Tony, I've got a better suggestion. What about Dr. Verity Boyd from Bayside Osteopathy? How about they go see her? Absolutely. We send them down there. So Verity, let's bring you in. Is it too late with five weeks out for people to go and get their niggles and aches looked at? Are they, they're, are they going to be worried that, oh, you know, maybe Verity's going to tell me that I can't do it, so they avoid it, or should they come in and start getting some treatment? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. No, I think it's totally fine to come and seek treatment now. You've got such a long time before you actually start walking, so we have heaps of time to get it going. You can get treatment right up until the morning of if you really needed to, so there's absolutely no, no we issues We have some early starts. That. Are you going to be up that early? Maybe the night before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, as Tony was saying, the people that are training and working through the program, they're actually putting their body through quite a bit at the moment. What are your recommendations to look after your body now so that they're not getting an injury before the day? Yeah, it's actually so important. I think that most importantly, really, though, if you have any niggles at all, you need to get them sorted as soon as possible. Give yourself as much time as you possibly can to get it sorted. So as osteos, we kind of believe in proactive treatment. If you're even just feeling a bit of tension, really, we want to try and get it seen to as soon as possible so that any buildup we can address. I think that stretching is probably the most important thing to do. Yeah. You can get dynamic stretches that are happening at the beginning to warm up properly yeah. and static to finish um, I also think I wrote down listening to your body is the most important <laughs> part. If you've got niggles, get them seen to, especially for walkers. We're looking in the feet, your Achilles, your calves, your hips and your glutes. Anything around there is really important to get addressed. The foam roller is probably another one, which I think you can use a lot to help yourself out with. If you don't have one, I highly recommend investing in one. They're really cheap way to sort your life out and actually address some of those muscles that are annoying you. Verity, would you use a foam roller when, like, at the moment we're encouraging them to do a really long team walk to build up to the distances? Even yep. if they got home from that long walk and they weren't feeling sore, would you still tell them get down on the floor and, and get into the foam roller? Absolutely. Proactivity is the best thing. Even if you're not feeling sore, you should definitely be rolling or stretching those muscles that you've been using during your walk. So it's your quads, your glutes, your hamstrings and your calves, which are most important to address after walking. Yeah. Do they ever get um, like sore upper bodies and stuff from carrying the packs? You can do. Um, yeah. Yeah, I definitely think if you've got your packs fitted well, you shouldn't yep. have any niggles. Um, so, again, that's probably something to look into if you're struggling with that. Um, you can always bring in your runners or you can bring in your packs to any appointments if you were worried as well. We yep. can always look at them and make sure that you've got it right. It's a great idea. Now, they're out on course. Mm -hmm. These guys are walking very long distances. Um, what's the best way to look after themselves on course? Yeah. Um, and get to that finish line warming up is a huge one don't leave don't get ready and go out and smash it all out without warming up mm -hmm. 10 minutes usually is enough to get a good warm-up done warming down is exactly the same thing yeah. you're using yeah. static stretches to warm down mm -hmm. um i know that Verity, you guys... can you just can you just explain what's the difference between a dynamic and a static stretch yeah. Dynamic stretches are moving the muscle whilst you're stretching them, while a static is like keeping the muscle held yeah. at a stretch for 35 seconds. Yeah. And what about the stretching? Every one of our wellness stops, we've got stretching stations, we've got foam rollers, resistance band, yoga mats, all that sort of stuff. They don't yep. get used very much. Oh, that's a silly idea. I feel like if they're there for you, you should use them as much as possible. Don't be shy in asking anybody either because we're out there. If you're not even sure how to stretch properly, um, that's fine. You just need to ask and someone will show you. There's plenty of people out there. So use what's available to you because, you know, it's there because we know it works. We know it helps. Even when you're feeling good? Even if you're feeling good, <laughs> most definitely be proactive, stretch those muscles that you've been using because if you don't, the tension will build up. As you guys are training now, you're going to be building up baseline tension within your muscles and pressure on your joints. So 
use yourself to real like use this time now that you've got to actually address it and again if they're stretching as part of their training program they should be learning to stretch um, and then be able to do that now our 100k walkers they're going to do a big day on day one they're going to go home and have a sleep come back and smash it out on day two it's a little bit different and usually with their training they're not getting used to two massive massive days what do you recommend they do on friday night when they get off course to make sure they can get through 57 kilometers the next day i think the most important thing is within 15 minutes of you having finished walking you should try and get that st static stretching started straight away as soon as you can ideally within 15 minutes you need to drink well you need to eat well and um, i think tony's touched on that quite well so no alcohol um, friday night nah don't do that <laughs> save it for don't do that. Night. <laughs> save it definitely save it um massage balling and foam rolling i think as well after you've done yeah. your stretches can be quite helpful um, and then, yeah, like I said, if you're not sure about anything, just ask so that you're, you know, you're getting access to the right information. Yeah, but go through that 43 kilometre finish line and don't just jump in the car and go back to your accommodation. Stay and use what we've got there on the spot. And again, everyone's so prepared that Tony's going to be bored. So he'll sit there and, and help stretch you out at the finish line. Yeah, I'm Absolutely. sure Tony would be more than happy to offer advice on stretching rather than treating blisters. <laughs> exactly. So on that topic, Tony, tell me what's the biggest issue that you see at the Great Aussie Hike? Look, I think there's well over 50 people on this Zoom chat tonight. And I think every one of us can, uh, can say the big B word, uh, blisters. Um, over the past couple of years working with, with the team at Great Aussie Height, we've probably treated well in excess of 150 people and 125 of those would have been for blisters. Um, and you've seen some good blisters too. First Great Aussie Height down uh, down in Gippsland yeah. was my, my best effort. I've still got yeah. a photo of it. Um, and when I showed we all it, still can remember it. Um, yeah. where a guy ring capped the top of his toe because uh, I told him not to take his plaster off and he did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he took the whole top of his toe off um but and then so, he kept walking. yeah look it's it's a case of um as i said earlier that preparation knowing your feet knowing your shoes making sure that you've got um in my case multiple pairs of shoes if you can change out your shoes to keep your feet dry um and then also uh socks at every wellness stop to change into fresh socks uh, your feet will love you forever so i think that's the perfect time to introduce the gorgeous emma from foot center group Emma, what's the magical formula for avoiding dreaded blisters on long walks? So we're talking about training because we do not want to get a blister and bring it into the challenge. Um, and then we want to get to the finish line with that one. So what's your advice? That's a really good question. Um, it all comes down to reducing moisture, friction and pressure within your boots. So that's probably the best place to start is making sure that your boots are fitting correctly. Um, and that they're comfortable with the socks that you're wearing as well. Now, it is good to invest in some really good socks um, that wick moisture, they're breathable. You've also got the compression built in, so they're not slipping and sliding around. And to have a few pairs that you can swap out during the event. Would you say no low-cut socks, Emma? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, low cut socks do have that tendency that over those longer distances, particularly going up and down terrain, they do have that tendency to slip down below the edge of your shoe and then you've, you're ripe for blisters. <laughs> yeah, so higher the better. <laughs> so a lot of people talk about taping their feet to avoid blisters. Is this something you recommend? Yes, it is. Um, it comes down to personal preference. Um, I've had some patients that just don't like it. Others love it. So that's mm -hmm. something to test out in your trial runs, in your um, practices. I've got a couple of different materials that you can use. So the first one is Hyperfix, so the hypoallergenic tape. It's nice and thin. It's breathable. Um, that's a good base to start with. Then you can use sports tape, so that rigid sort of orangey tape. The other options that are becoming more popular are the kinesio tapes. Just getting one bit here. So this is actually stretchy. So it's great for muscle aches and pains, but you can also use it for blister prevention. Um, the main thing is that we don't have any creases. So if you're applying it, it has to be completely smooth on the skin. 
because um, if there are creases, that's a, a pressure point and you can get blisters there as well. There's some great product recommendations. How do we know what to do with them? That's a good question. Um, we are looking at running a um, demonstration in a couple of weeks yep. um, that you can come along and have a look, um, try it out. But, yeah, that's probably the best way to do it because every foot's going to be different. Um, some people like to have their entire foot sort of taped up. Some like it just in their hot spots or just around their toes. So each sort of area of the foot does have a slightly different technique. Um, otherwise, you can come and find us on the course and we can help you out. But ideally, it would be good to have it on from the start. And then for those people who can't make it, um, we'll come along, we'll video the whole thing. Yes. Um, and then we can put the links to all the products and the video demonstration of how you suggest to tape their feet. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll pop it up in your training dashboard as well. So, Emma, pre-event, what's the kind of things we should be doing to look after our feet in the lead up? Oh, they're, they're out doing some big Ks at the moment. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's the biggest part is preparation. So like the other panel members have said, preparation, um, trying out different things that might be different socks, different shoes, um, trying different terrain in those as well. Now, in terms of socks, um, the fibres that we sort of look for are either wool or some synthetic fibres. We do want to avoid cotton if we can. Cotton tends to absorb moisture and then hold it against your skin, whereas the other fibres actually wick, it, wick the moisture away to keep your skin nice and dry, okay? Those fibres also help to regulate the temperature so your feet aren't going to overheat. Um, even though some of them are thicker, it actually does keep your feet nice and cool, okay? Now, in terms of socks, again, I've got some to show you. Um, one common one that people like is the cushioning underneath the forefoot and the heel. So that's where you're going to get most of the pressure when you're walking these longer kilometres. The next thing is a bit of compression or elastic through the arch and then through the ankle area. So this stops the sock from sliding down into the shoe and helps hold it nice and um, compressed against your skin. Another option is you might have heard wearing two socks. Um, that is a good option. So again, it's reducing that friction, friction and pressure within this shoe. The other option is to wear a sock that actually has two layers in it. So if you don't like the feeling of a double layer or it's too thick, the next one is to go for a double layer sock. The Emma, can I just ask you, if they wear the double socks, can that mm -hmm. change how your shoe fits? It does. Can your shoe yes. get a bit tighter? Yep. Absolutely. So... I always like to tell people, start with your socks. Make them nice and comfortable to fit. Yeah. Then once you're happy with the socks, you take them and go and get fitted for your shoes. That way you'll know if you're in the right fit, the right width, if there's any pressure spots remaining. Because um, if you go sort of shoes first, then we can be, it's a little bit trickier in terms yeah. of the options. Yeah. Yeah. How late can they leave it, to, people leave it to get new shoes before this walk? And um, that's a good question. So we don't want brand new shoes on the mm -hmm. course. Um, yeah. But then we also don't want completely worn out shoes either. Yeah. Um, so I generally say four to eight weeks. Um, yep. Basically what we so want right is, now. <laughs> yeah, right now is a good time. <laughs> um, it's a little bit different for everyone. So basically in that time, we want you to be able to wear them around the house really comfortably, short walks around the block, and then go out on a few training hikes. So for some people, they can do that in a couple of weeks. For other people, it takes a little while to build that up. So now is the perfect time to really check your shoes. Yeah. Um, I've got an example. But go buy socks. Here. Go get the socks sorted. Get your socks. Then then get your shoes. shoes. Yep. yep. So one thing to look at is the tread on the bottom. I found this old shoe at home. Um, we do want a nice bit of thick, grippy tread on the bottom. This is going to help you slipping and sliding around when those muscles are a little bit achy, but also the different terrain that you're covering during this hike. So for those who don't know, and thanks, Jess, for bringing it along, because I had my old shoes here that yours look a bit nicer than my old ones I had to hold up. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the lugs on the bottom of those shoes. Yes. So, so these... For yeah. people who don't know, this is a trail runner. Mm -hmm. um, and it a lot is. of people ask, should I wear sneakers or trail runners? We love that you've got a Brooks shoe up, Jess. Um, Emma, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so there are different shoes you can choose from. 
Now, runners do tend to go, well, they're designed for more forward motion instead of side to side. That's where the trail of the cross trainers come in. So they've got more lateral stability to stop ankle sprains um, and to help guide those muscles so they're not fatiguing too quickly. Um, now, the biggest difference with your trail shoes is the depth of the lugs on the bottom. So you can see these, they're nice and thick um, to give you that durability. Okay, these are a little bit more lightweight than a traditional hiking boot as well. So if you've yeah. tried them and thought, oh gosh, it's like I've got weights attached to the end of my feet, that's probably your next best shoe. Um, for me going out and knowing the course quite well, that's mm -hmm. the shoe that I'd 100% be in on day one. Mm -hmm. um, day two, I would carry my cross trainers plus that those ones I'd start off in those ones to hit down the Red Hill Rail Trail um, when we're doing the boardwalks um, there's some footpath walking up um, around the Western Port Bay Trail there's a little bit of road walking great to get into your cross trainers um, for the footpaths yeah. and then especially if there's been a bit of rain I know the weather forecast we can't tell in advance but it is forecast to rain the week before Devil Bend's probably going to get a bit muddy out so I'd be I tend to fall over so I really love having the lugs <laughs> especially the end of the day I would 100% and that's what you have support crew for to be carrying your extra pairs of shoes you don't necessarily have to wait for a wellness stop you can walk down um, the road and then give them a call they can meet you and you can swap your shoes over but yes keep moving changing shoes have yep. them definitely worn in um, for anybody looking to buy shoes um, Emma is in Mornington um, we've got the address is on your training dashboard they've just opened active feet store so this is, you are going to get um, an amazing professional, um, well-trained people that are going to help you pick your right shoes out. Um, your training dashboard also has a lovely discount from them to go in there. Um, for everybody else who can't get into the store, you could probably ring up and have a chat and get some advice anyway. Um, we were having a lovely chat with Brooks today and there's a nice little discount code that's only going to be valid for a very short time. Um, that we're expecting to come through in the next couple of days. So um, Brooks Shoes, um, I'm sure as Emma would agree, are fantastic for the kind of thing we're doing. Um, we're not just saying it because they give us a whole bunch to give away to everyone for free. <laughs> um, we, we only go, we only do stuff with brands that we, we want to support and um, make sure that you guys are getting good products. So there are lots of discount codes sitting in your training dashboard. Please go and have a look because we spend a lot of time going and begging people to support you. Um, but thank you very much for that, Emma. Now that we're on the topic of, um, of equipment, let's have a bit of a chat to Tony and Luke about the compulsory gear. I will just quickly bring up the list here. Um, so this is straight out of your participant information guide that I am hoping you have all downloaded and already had a bit of a look through. Um, Tony, let's start with you having a bit of a chat about the compulsory gear per team. The first thing I want to say is per team, yes, that means that one person can carry it and you only need one set of it. But if you are sharing the distance and people are coming on and off, it needs to stay with the team on course. It is no good with the person who is having a rest for the section. Um, so, Tony, why do they need a battery uh, phone battery charge pack? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, um, people are going to want to take photos, they're going to take videos and, and everything as we're out on course for hours and hours a day. Cool. And at the same time, we're going to have our GPSs going in all our phones um, using yep. uh, using Ride with GPS to get your course map, um, despite the fact that it'll be obviously really well signposted, um, thanks to Luke and the team. Um, but at the end of the day, you're going to run out of battery power um, over the course of a 12 or 14 hour day. Um, so a 10,000 or even a 20,000 milliamp battery charge pack for each team is something that we love you to have and you've got to have basically um, because whilst we do have the radios, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, your own phone um, is, what, uh, is what's going to get you through the day and we would hate you to get right towards the end and not have enough battery power to film the last bit. Um, oh, you have to, you have to get, you have to film yourself through the finish line. You do, you do. Yes, yes. Um, so that's what it's there for, folks. Um, first aid kit wise, yep. obviously, um, we'll provide you whatever support and assistance and treatment that you require at all the wellness stops and even within between the wellness stops. If you need us, we will be there. But we'd love you to be self sufficient as well, um, so that, as I said, we're bored and we do nothing except talk all day. Um, so, but Tony, person, the other thing for that is then it if because obviously a lot of them, it's going to take time for us to get to them and recover them. You can then be talking to them on their phone that's very charged up and telling yep. them how to start looking after their teammates with the gear you know they've got in their pack. 
Correct, correct. And, you know, it's it's only small. And you can put it into a Ziploc bag. It doesn't have to go into a proper first aid pouch, which costs you 30 or $40 just for the pouch. Pretty well, most of the teams last year, they were in Ziploc bags. Um, and um, there's there's a few things that you really should be putting in there. A triangular bandage or a sling for the old-fashioned terms, it can be used for a multitude of things. You can support a limb. You can use it as a bandage. You can use it as a bandana. You can do all sorts of things. Um, but a triangular bandage is where I always start with these sorts of things. Um, blister prevention, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the shoal products that uh, are there for when you've got a hot spot and you need a little bit more than just purely taping. Um, these new blister pads are amazing. Um, I've been using them for years and years and years, and they're designed not to come off. I've had them on for 30 days uh, walking through the Himalayas. Um, once you put them on, you don't take them off until you stop walking. Um, so blister pads are really, really important. Um, get some of that paper stretchy tape that we were talking about earlier. Um, it's really, really good to, to reapply or apply to hotspot areas, then cover it in a slightly thicker tape. So you need a couple of different tapes. Um, some sterile dressings. Uh, what have I got here? Things like... Um, Island dressings, that sort of thing. They're just, you probably won't be able to see it in the back there, but they're just little island dressings to go over grazers and, and that sort of thing. Some gauze swabs, um, again, to um, get uh, get any gravel and things out if you have a tumble. Um, they're really, really good. Some tiny little, um, uh, where are we here, splinter probes. They're really good to have um, because we're out in the bush. Um, none of this weighs very much, folks. So, and it doesn't take up a lot of uh, a lot of space in your pack. Um, or your first aid kit. Um, last few, something that is last really, few people really were getting into a sandwich Ziploc bag. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, don't skimp on it, though. Um, no. You know, at the end of the day, we want you to be um, safe out there. Um, and as part of it, obviously, uh, your personal medication is over on the left-hand side. But with your medication, um, if you are not allergic to ibuprofen, um, then that's something that has a dual capability. It has some pain relief but it also has some anti-inflammatory capabilities. You can put it with paracetamol and get a really, really good efficacy or effect from combining the two at the same time if you're not allergic to ibuprofen. Um, so it makes the Panadol work better and the ibuprofen work better as an anti-inflammatory. And at the end of the day, my old joints, it loves ibuprofen and it loves Panadol when you go and do 30 and 40K hikes. Um, so, uh, so that's something you want to keep in there. Um, what else? A small pair of scissors would be good. Um, and uh, some antihistamine tablets. Doesn't matter what they are, Telfast or any of those. We're out in the bush again. And if you either run into anything that is stinging in the course of, of trees and bushes and nettles and that sort of thing, uh, there's lots of bull ants up through that area. Um, antihistamines are something that will just allow you that little bit of relief as well. So some antihistamine tablets are something I would put in there. Um, and that's really your basic first aid kit. Um, on top of that and the next one down, heavyweight tape bandages or snake bandages. They're sometimes called smart bandages. Um, they are, there you go, um, those ones there. I believe we've got a deal going on these, Anna. Yeah, so Tony loves these so much. He's like, go and hit up survival um, because obviously there are extra snakes around with all the rain and sunshine and everything that's been. It's still a very low risk, but we are making you carry it because if you get bitten by a snake, um, it's I'm going to be on Two Bay's trail, a good chance. It is going to take Luke and Tony a minute to get to you. So you as teammates need to be grabbing these out straight away um, and getting them on your teammate. Tony is on the phone telling you what to do, but you have to have these. Um, we don't let anybody um, in our crew or volunteers or anything go out without these ones. They do cost a little bit more money than the heavyweight crate bandage. But I know if I get bitten by a snake, I'm not going to care about an extra $10. Um, the best thing about them is that because they are a rectangle and they pull to a square, you know you've got the tension correct to be saving that venom going through your body. So it's just a non-muck around one. Um, it did take us a while to get this promo code. It is only, I think, for possibly two weeks. Um, have a look in your training dashboard, but there is a discount for survival. Um, you can get all your first aid gear there, but if you want to get your other stuff at the chemist, um, highly recommend getting these. You only need them for your team, but you should be carrying them out when you're doing your training walks and stuff um, at the moment, especially we live in Australia, um, but especially given the current climate, um, Parks Victoria are all over. Everyone's going to be more prepared for snakes this year. 
Yep. And that also goes with, as Anna said, the amount of moisture that's around and the heat that's around and the humidity that's around. Um, I walk through the briars literally three times, four times a week, and I would see snakes 25 to 50% of the time um, on the side of the trail somewhere. Um, so uh, carry a couple of these. Um, you need to bandage if it's, a, if it's a bite on your lower limb, which is where it's probably going to be. You need to bandage from the toes all the way up to the groin if you can. That's why you need two of them as a bare minimum. Um, and then uh, that will stop, as Anna said, the envenomation going through your lymphatic system and getting you really, really unwell. And then Luke and I will come and find you. And uh, who knows, you may even get a free ride in a helicopter. Um, and, but uh, start, the... start carrying them with you now, training. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Same as the space blanket or the emergency blanket. Um, I didn't put one on my bench, I do apologise. Um, but just the little foil blankets, um, a couple of those goes a long, long way. If you have someone that is uh, in, a, in a, a state where they are no longer able to continue and it's going to take Luke and I a little bit of time to get there, especially on a day like today, they'll cool down really, really quickly. Um, and we use these emergency blankets um, in the course of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis on ambulances um, constantly. Um, I think I used six of them on Sunday for the triathlon that I uh, that I did medical at. Um, just to stop when people just stop on the side of the road, the first thing we do is bring out a space blanket because they're sweating and the sweat then has uh, an effect on your body temperature. And that's why those little emergency blankets are really, really important. They're only four or five bucks each. Um, yeah. They weigh nothing. And that's the good thing about this stuff, folks. Your little uh, phone battery charge pack, that's got a little bit of weight to it. Um, but if you share the love and share the gear around, um, yeah. then all this stuff will uh, will fit into one backpack, let alone three or four. Yeah. Without too much of an issue. And then we've got our safety briefing coming up on the 8th of March. So that's when we'll run through um, Ride with GPS um, and the radios and stuff like that in a little bit more detail. Just saw the time and thought we, <laughs> we'll keep wriggling along. Um, Luke, quickly tell us about the compulsory items per person. Um, again, we'll go through these again at the safety briefing, but what should people be getting now and using in their training to get used to? Has Luke gone to sleep? Luke's gone, maybe. I don't know. Um, Are you on mute, Luke? He's just he's only in the other room. <laughs> I'll stick my All right. Anyway, um, I'll, yeah, we'll do, go for it, Tony. All right. So obviously hydration, as we've spoken about a lot, is really, really important. Um, I don't use water bladders because I've had one break on me. Um, I use bottles and I put them in the side of my pack and away I go. But whatever works, works. There is no right. There is no wrong. Um, and a combo of um, both uh, electrolyte and water is really, really important. Your personal medication, wherever you may be on, um, don't forget it. Um, whilst we're really good at what we do, we're not a pharmacy. We don't carry the medication that you may or may not need. Um, so that's important. We've Can spoken I also about that. Just add to that, Tony, it's always really great just to have some Panadol and ibuprofen or Nurofen in your medical first aid kit as well. Yep. Um, you know, yep. even if you don't take that every day, great to have that on course as well. Oh, there's a very good chance you'll need it. Um, and uh, obviously your snacks. Um, usually bars, nuts, dried fruit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Really, really important. Luke's back. Yeah, Luke's sorry, back. Guys, I had to run to another room. Um, now, uh, I thanks, think the rest Tony. of it we can do in the safety briefing. That's yeah. enough to get them going. Um, let's have a little bit of a quick talk um, about your team. So the Great Aussie Hike is about mates and doing this as a team. So, Stefan and Jess, we'd love to hear from you both as past participants about how you found the team experience. If you've got any tips for what teams can be doing now in training that are going to help them for the day, getting around on course, any of that stuff that people can also include looking after teammates in their preparation plans. Absolutely. Yes. Um, sorry, Stefan. <laughs> um, no, so, our team last year was all across Victoria, so we didn't necessarily get a chance to train together. So we had an Instagram chat um, and we did Zoom catch-ups and to check in with how we were going and training and concerns and things like that. And so even some of the things we talked about was, you know, if someone is unable to finish, what is that going to be like for that person but also the team and what calls do we make? You know, do we all stop together or, you know, what were some of the rules around that as a team? Um, we also they're use... really good to talk about before the day um, there's a lot of emotions and up and down and stuff on the day so it's great to have that stuff defined before you hit the course absolutely and I think you know one of the because it was the first time that a lot of us had met 
as well. So just having um, using some of the questions, the mindset questions and things like that and asking each other. So when we got to there for the day, we already felt like we knew each other and could connect on multiple different things. Um, so I know this year some of our team members have already um, gone out and been able to um, train together, which has been great. But again, um, you know, having some Zoom catch ups with your other teammates and things like that and just chatting about, okay, well, you know, how's your preparation gone? Or, you know, do you need a hand with this? Or can you recommend some good trails to even walk on? So being able to do that, those things as well. Um, one of the things that I'd recommend is if you're not already part of is to join the Facebook um, community group. That's a really great source of inspiration and everyone's really supportive and gets around each other as well. Um, you know, it's great to see different people training in different areas and sharing photos and trails and, um, you know, just being able to hype each other up a bit as well. And what about you, Steph, and what do you recommend to, um, again, the 100K, you're tackling that. Um, lots of people, there's different emotions up and down throughout the day. Um, how do you, you best support your teammates? Keep some harmony in the team. Yeah, obviously I have a boombox, so I love having some music going. Um, and yeah, I think Jess really nailed it. I think communication is the key to success and um, being able to talk about your fears, your thoughts, your emotions um, leading up to the event. And on the day of the event, you don't know how people are going to react. You may I've known them for a long time, but if you, they are new to the team, um, they might go quiet. So um, check in with people, ask them how they're feeling on the day. But yeah, Jess covered it spot on. And I think it's important to remember you don't have to walk right beside everybody in your team for the whole distance. Um, you've got to stay within visual eyesight so that you can help each other out and be there to support and things. But you can have, if you want to have half an hour by yourself, that's okay. If you want to have half an hour just with one other person and you're walking, you know, 20 or 30 metres away from the team, that's okay as well. So don't think you've got to be shoulder to shoulder um, together. If you just think, I just need a little bit of time by myself, take it um, and just communicate it with your teammates. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And you can stop between the rest stops as well. Like I know yep. last year, quite often we would just stop and say, okay, how's everyone feeling? And, yep. you know, often a common response with our team was everything sore from the boobs below or, <laughs> you know, so make it fun and engaging yeah. as well or stop for fun at all and, you know, just do that thing and support each other as well. Like I know for our team there was a couple of tears when we crossed the finish line yesterday because it was last year because it was like, yeah. yay, we've done it. But also, you know, it was such a, a long day as well for some of us and, yeah, just, you know. Don't worry, we cry when the last team crosses the finish line because we're like, they all got home again. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think, you know, being able to lean on your team and say, oh, look, I've, you know, I don't know if we've got another 10K in me, but just being in that team environment can sometimes help get you over the finish line as well. Great advice. Now, something that we will start um, getting at this stage is we um, commonly start getting a lot of emails from people going, I'm really worried. I'm scared. I'm going to let my teammates down. I don't think I'm prepared enough. I'm really worried if I don't make it to the finish line, they're all going to get disqualified and kicked off. I don't think I should come. Um, how how would you respond to that, Jess? Look, I think I was probably the last person over the finish line last year. <laughs> um, and that's okay. I had the sweeps right behind mm -hmm. me. And look, you don't kick us off, of course. I think, you know, be open and honest with your team as well. That's what they're there for. I had a really bad run up with injury and illness to last year's event. Um, so unfortunately my training, the furthest I'd got to walk in a day was 12K. So for me, doing the 30 was, you know, quite an extension of my personal best. Um, but being in that team environment for me got me across the finish line as well. And the welcoming and community sense and even just, coming up to the finish line and hearing people cheer and clap and you know how nice that was to kind of finish in that atmosphere as well is really important and, and it's really important communication Sorry. is so important yeah. and talk to your team or you know um talk to you guys through the radios on the track and say look can you bring the buggy pass just to hype us up a little bit or yeah. those kind of things you know that really creates a lot of energy as well and it's not all, it, the buggies are also there if you need to hop in the buggy. So it's not an issue to go, I just need a little bit of a spell. Everybody else wants to keep walking. Jump in the buggy. You go around with everybody else and cheer them up and 
yeah. um, you know, give everyone else a bit of a pep up, then we'll find your team and drop you back off with them. So we always say the most courageous thing you can do is turn up at the start line because that's the hardest thing to do. If you guys can get yourself to the start line, the longer distances you've got your support crew, so you can hop off course, you can have a rest, you can hop back on. There is no, um, if you leave the course, everyone's kicked off or anything like that, take the rest let people keep going. If your team's getting low in numbers, another team around them will, will say, okay, walk with us for a little bit. Um, again, the last 15 Ks, we've got two ATV buggies out around Devil Bend this, this year. So there's lots of opportunities to get picked up, get to the start line, um, and then we'll help you get to the finish line. But that's what we want you to do is go, I can do it um, and just just get there on the day. Yep. Um, and your team will help you through that. Yeah, and, and you'd be amazed. Will, and then your community yeah. helps you on top of that. Amaze the adrenaline and the motivation and when everyone's supporting you on the day, um, what a difference that makes. All right, who has got some questions for our panel? We've got some in the in the chat, but I just want to open up and see if there's anybody listening who's got one now before I quickly run through this list. We've got some of them. Um, will there be toilets along the trail? Yes, yeah, so there's toilets at every wellness stop. Um, we also have toilets at different spots along the trail. Um, Luke's dad is amazing. He drives around. He's got four trailers on the back of his use um, this year going along. Um, and there's also spots along the trail where there's public toilets. Um, we talk a lot about this in the safety briefing. So um, just know there are toilets. Um, however, in your training, still be aware that there's not a toilet every two kilometres. You still need to um, develop some, some bladder control. <laughs> Yes, um, and they'll all be marked. There is a Google map as well that will have these marked on them. Where the and I would recommend, like, even if you don't feel like you need to go when you're at the wellness stop and there's toilets, go. Yeah. You know, go. do that as well. Take advantage of all the services that are available at the wellness stops. Get your blisters treated by Emma. You know, get a massage by Verity. Um, it's really yeah, and I mean, even Shoals just jumped on board and they've given us enough blister um, packs that every team can go out onto the course with actual those blister packs um, that they can grab and other ones along the course. So we've got heaps of resources um, to help you out. Um, and uh, yeah, as Verity said, use the stretching stations, use everything we've got there. Um, the question we often get asked is about poles. Um, who wants to take that one for us? I'll grab that one because I absolutely love them. Um, <laughs> then yes, we'll get I'm someone old, who doesn't like yes, them. <laughs> I don't have a great deal of balance, but I'm about to go and walk 160 kilometres in the Himalayas um, and every single metre of it, I will have two poles with me. Um, they are proven to take 20 to 25% of the stress and the strain off your hips, off your quads and off your knees. Um, that is a proven fact. Um, we talked a little bit before about upper body pain. Um, if you're using your poles correctly, you'll get a potentially a little bit of tricep and a little bit of shoulder soreness. Um, but they are amazing for balance um, and amazing for taking that little bit of extra shock, both downhill and uphill from your hips, your quads, uh, your glutes and your knees. But you do not turn up on the day with poles for the first time. Uh, so no. you either use them in your training or you don't use them at all. That's that's our big thing. Yeah. If you use um, them on day one and day one is Great Aussie Hike, you look like you've got calipers, not poles. Yeah, that's it. Um, make sure if you are getting some to get lightweight ones that can fold up if you need to get rid of them, that you can um, attach them to your backpack quite easily. Um, you don't need them. You don't have to have them. Most people won't have them. Um, as Tony said, there are some great benefits to it, but our big thing is do not turn up on challenge day and start using poles for the first time. So that's a personal choice one. Absolutely. It's not actually, it's not required. Just, but, just, yeah. just, a, just a question around, yeah. um, just a question around the starting, starting time on the first day. Is that, mm -hmm. is that like uh, 6, 7 a.m.? Is it, and how long do, before that would we arrive? Just thinking about getting organised for things like, you know, blister prep, prep packs and prep and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so, Jeff, um, if you down if you download your participant info guide, this has got all that information in it, but we will open up the start line um, is always open an hour before. Are you doing the – you're talking about the 100K? Yep, yep. Yep. So that is um, – that will be open from 6 a.m. The first thing you're going to have to do is get past Luke and Tony are going to be the little guards right at the gate. You have to come in with your compulsory equipment or we're sending you straight back to your car to go and get, get it. Get through them. That's when you can come through and then get your race packs. 
Um, you'll get your team radio that we'll talk more about at the safety briefing. Um, that's when Tony's also hanging around. I think we might have somebody else who's going to be helping <laughs> so, uh, at the, at, to be able to help you with that kind of stuff. You'll be doing your warm up. You can get um, your Shoals products, all that sort of stuff then. Um, we like to have everybody sorted out by about quarter to seven. Um, so we can do a warm up and we do a little bit of a um, sunrise, just a little ceremony coming together. Again, we're not a sporting event, we're a community event. So it's just great for us to get together and have a moment. Um, and then we start as we turn around and um, watch the sun coming out over the cliffs um, and we go out on course together. Um, we try and get out as close to 7 a.m. Last year we had to hold off because we had gale force winds and Parks Vic wouldn't let us off till 7.30. So um, there's always those little bits and pieces, but you really wanna aim to get there about six and give yourself that good hour before you hit the course. Six to six. It will be, it'll be pitch, yeah, it'll be pitch black dark. So make sure that you've got head torches as well. Yep. And that first. Yeah. Um, anybody else got something before we throw? Can I just say as well, if you've never yep. walked with a head torch on, probably good to practice that as well um, at some stage as well. And shining in other people's eyes. Yeah. That's another good one to remember. Yeah. Um, All right, Luke, have a talk about shoes for the 30Ks. We've got um, a question here. Um, because they don't have the support crew, do they need to carry a spare pair of shoes in their bag? You don't necessarily have to carry a spare pair of shoes. You just have to have a pair that is you're happy and prepared to be using. Um, it's good to have a spare pair at the end, so or in the car, um, to change into afterwards. So that you get out of these ones. Socks are important. Or you can also con a friend into hanging around for the day with your gear too. Well, just it's the support crew is just not compulsory for the thirty k. Yeah. Um, yeah, but. Taking those socks, taking your shoes off at the wellness stops um, when you do have that little break, and then change your socks over because they will help out with that um, non change of shoes as you go on. Um, the participant info guide, um, it's, there's been a link to that in your last two emails that you've, uh, your last two newsletters that will be on every week. No, it is not on the website because there's a lot of stuff in here that is just for paid registered participants, um, especially those promo codes. A lot of them we had to work very hard for um, and they are very limited just to our participants. Um, when you go to our website, there's the log in button. We hope that you have been logging into your dashboard quite a bit because that's where um, cycles one to four of your training program have been. That's where the eight-week training program is. That is where your participant info guide is. That is where we will keep putting stuff or your yep. discount codes. Um, we have put up YouTube videos of the info session. And this video will go this up This video well. will go up there. Um, we've got information. Um, I know Emma, the Foot Centre Group, have put up hints and tips that are there. So, yeah, that is where your resource knowledge is. But, yes, you can go to greataussiehike.com.au. In the, in the menu, click Login. Um, and then you get straight through to everything that you need. So check out the training resources on there and you'll find your participant guide and all those training. And yes, we are getting um, all the information from tonight. Um, as Emma said, she's making the video, we'll put that in. Tony's going to write us a little thing on the first aid kit um, and put that in there. Um, so we will just keep putting all this kind of stuff um, up there. Um, okay. Okay, Ride with GPS apps uh, and maps. We will be releasing more around the... Um, safety briefing. Uh, there are private properties that we go through uh, that we're trying to uh, look after those people because otherwise we're not allowed to walk on them. Yeah, so and people, unfortunately, yeah, yeah, last year we released it a bit earlier and we had people training. Um, and again, it makes it harder for us to get permission to go and walk on these courses. Um, there's roads that are traditionally 80 and 100 kilometres that we have got significant traffic management in place to make them safe for you to go down so we can link up all these gorgeous parts of the peninsula. Um, people going out and walking along that road and going, oh, I'm just here training for the Great Aussie Hike doesn't help us get permits um, the next year. So um, again, we also don't really want you training on the course. Go and explore other parts of Victoria, go and do other things. Um, it's a bit different when it's a sporting event, you're trying to get a timing and things like that. Um, or there's not good maps and course marking and there's races and you've got to learn the course. No, 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 go train somewhere else. Half the fun is exploring somewhere new. Um, safety briefing is March the 8th. Um, that is compulsory for um, a couple of members for the 43, 57 and 100 plus your support crew person. Um, that's when we get really serious. We start talking about the snake bites. We start talking about course evacuations in bushfires, um, all that sort of stuff. That's, that's the real serious stuff. 30 kilometres, it's not compulsory um, because there's not as many safety concerns. You're not as remote. We can get to you a lot more. It's also really handy. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's still really good that we um, recommend someone. 
um, jump in. All right, have we got any more questions from the floor? All right, I'm just gonna start off with, um, thank you so much guys. We always talk a little bit longer than we anticipate. Um, I just wanna quickly run around the panel um, and finish off with some advice from everybody on the panel. Their one big hint and tip that they wanna leave um, all our participants with tonight. So let's start with you, Jess, because you're top left-hand corner for me. Have fun. Um, yeah. It's a great event. It's a great feeling and a great community. And just have fun and enjoy the the day um, yeah. or the two days. Um, Luke and Anna and the GAR team create an amazing atmosphere. Enjoy it. Everyone is so friendly and nice on course. So you'll meet other people as well. And just, yeah. Have a great time. What have you got for us, Verity? I think the, the most important take home from me is to look after your bodies. Doesn't matter if it's feeling sore right in this moment, you can be proactive, you can seek some help. The more tailored the approach can be, the more success you're going to have. So come and get some help if you would like it. And even if you're just questioning it, I'd definitely hit us up. And Verity might not know, but there is also a nice little deal um, from Bayside Osteopathy in the training dashboard as well. If you want to go and see it, they've given a nice little discount off the first visit as well, which is lovely. Um, Emma, what can you give us? Um, similar to Verity, listening to your body um, and especially with your feet um, treating blisters um, or even hot spots, pressure points really early. That's key to prevent the blister in the first place. So use the Shoals products. Yes. Go see Emma and um, her colleagues at the Foot Centre group. They are all, um, is there, how many? Is there six? Five. So five, five like, different centres. So yeah. you can easily, <laughs> most of you will be able to find them. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, shoe advice at, at Active Feet as well. Yes. Tony, what have you got for us? Oh, it's got to be about our nutrition, I think. Um, eat something that's really, really good and healthy and eat it often. Uh, drink lots and lots of uh, both water and electrolytes um, and at the end of the day eat drink and be merry um, and uh, and have fun out there but uh, fuel your body for success is probably the right thing to say thanks tony stefan yeah hi guys so um yeah the great aussie hike have now partnered with lifeline so um we're all about mental health here as well so make sure that you're checking out the wonderful mental health resources and all of the participant guides and everything on their website um they've done a fantastic effort putting everything together on their website so um i would make sure that i've got everything printed i've got everything labeled written down or everything's all organized and now it's about just making sure that um yeah, you've got no surprises, as we said earlier on the day. So, um, yeah, no, thanks heaps, guys, for putting in all the effort and organising all those great resources. Thanks, Stefan. What have you got for us, Luke? Basically, just get yourself ready and healthy and to the start line and uh, we'll help you get there to the end. And for me, it always comes back to kindness. Remember why we're doing this, what we're on about. We're not a big sporting event. There is no million dollar prize for whoever comes first. The biggest cheer is always left for the last team over the line. We're just that kind of event. So in all of that, be kind to your teammates. Be kind to the GAR volunteers and the crew and the first aid and, and all the, you know, allied health and everybody that's out there. And please remember to be kind to yourself as well. Do not be hard on yourself. Get yourself to the start line and we'll get you to the finish. So thank you everybody for attending tonight. Thank you to um, all our panelists. Um, we look forward to checking in with you again on March 8th when it really heats up and is getting serious. And we that's a, that's very serious talks. And then we we hit the course and have a lot of fun together. Thanks everyone. Perfect. Thank you. There. Yeah.